This is the all new Jeep Wrangler. And I know what you're thinking, looks exactly like the old Jeep Wrangler, right? And the one before that, and the one before that. In fact, the Wrangler hasn't changed much at all since it arrived in 1986. And even then, it looked pretty much like every Jeep that came before it. The stick out fenders, the squared off wheel arches, the circular headlights, the barbecue style grill. Honestly, you could cook an entire cow on that. It's a look that can trace its roots all the way back to the 1940s, to the Wrangler's great, great grandfather. The original Willys Jeep. I mean, forget your mirrors and E-types. You want a real design icon? Check out GI Joe back there. Believe it or not, a Jeep similar to this one is one of only eight cars on permanent display at the New York Museum of Modern Art. It is, they say, one of the world's very few automotive masterpieces. And that's not bad for a car designed in just 11 days flat. You see, back in World War II, the Americans realized that victory in Europe would depend on a huge land invasion. To rid the world of fascism, they needed some wheels, and they needed them fast. So, US Army chiefs called on America's car makers to come up with a car, giving them less than two weeks to submit designs. The brief was for a 4x4 that could carry a quarter of a tonne and with a wheelbase under 80 inches so they could squeeze as many as possible into landing craft and aircraft holds. Anyway, of all the USA's hundred or so car companies, the only one to deliver a bid on time was a little known firm called American Bantam. Until then, Bantam had been importing tiny British built Austins and giving them new bodies that made them look like clown cars. Yet somehow their Blitz buggy design ticked all the boxes for a tough, all-American war machine. The problem was, they didn't have the means to actually make it, not in the vast numbers required. So, the government gave their drawings to Ford, as well as Willys Overland Motors in a hire. Finally, after a bit of fiddling, Willys stood to attention and delivered the goods. Although Ford still played a part in refining and producing the final car, what became known as the MB. And this is what they made. Well, almost. Before anyone writes in, I should say that this particular model, the M38, actually came a little bit later and was built in Holland using imported parts. Anyway, the point is, America and our allies now had a lightweight, no-nonsense off-roader that could be parachuted onto the battlefield and tackle almost any terrain. As well as carrying Private Ryan and his mates, it could be fitted with machine guns and shovels and anything else you needed to survive a wartime drive. Except, of course, for armour. For that, you had to make do with a tin hat. It was so effective that Jeep became code for anything that went off-road, whether it was an actual Jeep or not. Overnight, the Willys Jeep revolutionised battlefield transport. And it was amazingly versatile. Just a few tweaks and it could be used for desert patrol, snow plowing, cable laying and sawmilling. Some were turned into fire engines, field ambulances, tractors and even trains. Best of all, every single one of them could fly for about three seconds. There were, however, a few problems. For starters, there isn't much in the way of weatherproofing. They haven't even bothered with doors, and you can forget social distancing. In a Willys, privates were quite literally pressed together. What else? Well, this gear shift down here is about as slick as a jammed rifle. And then there's the suspension, which is constantly, whoa, trying to throw you overboard. On the other hand, it was virtually unstoppable off-road forcing its way through shallow waters, sand dunes, swamps and forests. Pulled along by a 2.2 litre four-cylinder petrol engine, nicknamed the Go Devil. Despite mustering just 54 horsepower, it was actually quite torquey and you had a two-speed transfer box down here for extra low gears. Short of an actual tank, it was one of the most effective off-roaders of its time. So effective, in fact, that I reckon it could give a modern 4x4 a run for its money. Hmm. 
There are 80 years between these two cars, give or take. So what difference has eight decades made to mud plugging progress? There's only one way to find out. Come on then, Mr. 50 Grand Wrangler. Let's see what you got. <laughs> oh, there he is. There he is. He's sticking with it. He's probably listening to um, Radio 4 in there, got his heated seats on. Doesn't get more analog than this. You're feeling everything, every turn, every bump, every, every puddle. Got my nice jeans on and everything. All in all, about 630,000 Jeeps fought in World War II. It was, said General Eisenhower himself, one of the three most important instruments in securing Allied victory, along with the Douglas Dakota and the D-Day landing craft. General George Marshall, another US Army chief, went one step further, describing it as America's greatest contribution to modern warfare. But despite all its battlefield glory, it was actually during peacetime that Jeep really made its name, with military models swiftly converted into civilian versions that gradually evolved into the Wrangler we know today. Famously, it also inspired another automotive icon. At the end of the war, an original Jeep fell into the hands of a man called Morris Wilkes, chief designer of the Rover Company. Using the Jeep as a template, he came up with a boxy, no-nonsense 4x4 to help relieve the burden from Britain's overworked tractors. With that, the Land Rover was born, and so too was a new off-road rivalry. So, the Jeep might have won the war, but in doing so, it started another one. 